Our second speaker in the, this session is Clive Shepherd. Clive Shepherd is an e-learning consultant and chair of the e-learning network. He spent 25 years trying to make learning things happen electronically. Amongst other things, he writes enthusiastically and intelligently on his eponymous blog. In this session, Clive is going to talk to us about exploring the new e-content pyramid. Hand over to you, Clive. Thank you. Okay, thanks, John. Um, <coughs> I feel a little bit um, in a minority for one of the uh, first times in, in years making presentations in that I don't normally speak to an audience that's primarily educationally based. Can I ask, is, is there anybody here who doesn't work in the educational sector? There's, okay, so I'm right. I really am in a minority here today. <laughs> okay, well, I, I, I obviously can only speak from my experience. I don't want to talk about a, a sector that I don't know. But having worked for a very long time in, in learning technology and uh, hopefully done a little bit more than stick to the knitting, as uh, Jilly was suggesting some of us might do, um, I, I think that um, I'm hoping that uh, what I have to talk about has some parallels outside that particular domain. So I'm going to trust that those of you who ha haven't, if you like, been involved in learning technology from the perspective of teaching people how to do their jobs um, can see parallels in what I'm going to talk about. Certainly, I thought that you would be able to find parallels when I uh, put this particular talk together. Because I'm not talking about the whole learning process, <clears throat> and I'm particularly not talking about the collaborative aspect of the learning process. I'm talking today about content in particular. And the reason I'm doing that is because in the uh, world of uh, learning technology as it relates to the employment sector, if you like, uh, content has been by far the dominant aspect of the, the dominant manifestation of e-learning. And in many respects, that's slightly regrettable. And I'm going to talk about that particular, how we've got to that situation. It might be regrettable, but on the other hand, even that side of it is, uh, is undergoing some challenges and some opportunities, which reflect very much on what Julie was talking about and, and no doubt many of the other speakers have talked about. So I think we're looking at not just one form of uh, e-content in the future, but many forms and some exciting uh, developments, which do threaten in some ways the very hierarchical, top-down structures of, of the way most organizations run. And let's first face, it, face it, most of us don't work in organizations like Google. We work in, well, uh, you know, insurance companies and banks and in the civil service or in universities. And we don't necessarily have the luxuries of, um, of being, have, having an enormous amount of bottom-up influence in organizations. So I thought that um, I'd take you back a little bit. Does anybody know who that person is? Me? How could it possibly be? Well, this was actually, according to my um, reckoning, 100,000 years ago. Now, if anybody can work out why I'm saying that, then I will give you a prize at the end of, the, uh, end of my talk. That's an op that's a, so somebody can start fiddling around with that one. Um, 100,000 years ago. Just to show that it was 100,000 years ago, you can see on the screen there's quite a few clues. First of all, you see the reel-to-reel -reel tape deck, yeah? the, um, the valve-driven TV, the um, Habitat um, poster on the wall, um, from the days when that was the only place you could ever you could buy furniture that, that uh, well, in this case, it was mainly green and orange. A, a vinyl, a vinyl um, a record deck, a BT trim phone, and uh, kipper ties and flares, which, of course, have been around at least twice since then. And, of course, hair was very much in fashion <laughs> in those days, uh, although you can see it was, it was receding at that point. Well, in those, uh, it was about 100,000 years ago that I joined the world of uh, learning and development. It, it was a few years after that that I would say I was a learning technologist. But uh, nevertheless, it's been, uh, I've, I've had a fair stint at this particular job. And uh, in, in le learning and development generally, I, I always like to think that nowhere near as much has changed as has in the rest of the world. But I'm going to concentrate on learning technology and what's changed there. And the way I'd like to do that is to give you a little bit of a sort of history lesson uh, therefore, this is the TARDIS, this is for, for Doctor Who fans. We're going to take a time machine back over those uh, decades and see how I think learning technology has changed in the world of the corporate world, if you like. I think there'll be some parallels for you, um, but this is very much how I see it. And so this is a UK history of corporate e-learning. And another way of phrasing that is, um, or um, every dog has its day. 
which I didn't know whether that was a sort of rude thing to say. I don't think it is. That's, I think that uh, it, it may offend you if you don't come up in the right place in the sequence. We'll see. But anyway, if we go back to the 70s in the world of e-learning, it wasn't called that then, of course, as it applied to the world of work. This was very much the era of the designer. And as the Americans gave us this term, instructional designer, I don't, ne never have liked that term, but that is still the term we primarily use in this country for describing someone who designs an e-learning experience. But this really was their era. And uh, uh, unfortunately, and, and this may not apply as, as much in education, but in the corporate world, the heritage of that instructional design um, era was very much from, I would say, not, not a behaviorist perspective, but certainly cognitivist, and, and certainly not a very liberal educational philosophy. Much of it was driven by the US the, the military and the work that they did on instructional design in the Second World War. And in many respects, we've had a lot of trouble shaking that off. And I think there's still, uh, if you were to do a course on instructional design today, you'd still be trotted out very much the same old material that people were taught back in the 1970s. But this was the era when the designer was king. In that respect, we have to say that uh, 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 that was a very fortunate period. Because along came, the, uh, does anybody remember laser vision? The, uh, you know, the, this, is, this is very embarrassing if you have to put your hand up to these things, because it shows, it shows that you are uh, <coughs> very much in the baby boomer generation, and therefore can't be too long before you retire. <laughs> Which is supposed to be a catastrophe for the world, as we, uh, as we know. But, uh, and in my case, it will be. But the, um, <laughs> the, I, I, I remember the era of video very fondly because I came into learning technology through, the video, through video and through training. And uh, we had um, some fantastic projects done in the early 80s with using video disc hooked up to BBC microcomputers, Apple IIs, and uh, IBM PCs. And does anybody remember the Doomsday Project? Yeah, yeah what a fantastic project. Apparently, somebody has managed to get it working again on a modern computer, which is because it really was a wonderful piece of work. I always think the I always look back fondly on these periods because it always seemed to me that the very best work I've ever encountered was done in those days in content development. I'm talking about not in the use of um, technology for learning in a broader context, but some of the very best work was done there. And if we go on into more into the later 80s, the, the era of the programmer. This is when people used to do artificial intelligence degrees. Is anybody unfortunate enough to do that? Um, it's, it's a profession which is, which is very much subsided, big, uh, uh, along with all sorts of um, dreams that never quite came to reality. But one of the interesting side effects of the era of the programmer in the design of content was that we really did a, a, a attempt some very ambitious things, particularly in areas like the concept of intelligent tutoring, software that was genuinely personalized, that genuinely responded to you as an individual, that built up a profile of you as an individual, and was able to um, come back to you with in intelligent responses. Whether that's a worthwhile thing or not, it was a great thing to try. Unfortunately, I don't think there are anywhere near as many attempts being done at doing that now. But in the era of the programmer, before everything done was done with rapid tools, those, those sort of things were quite common. And in fact, I remember having uh, an AI uh, programmer working for me in languages like Lisp and things that I had no... And I actually managed to find a bit of Lisp there on the Google Images to show you. Out there. But languages which have been long forgotten. But we really did attempt some interesting things. But that, the era, era of programmer... Um, faded, as with the era of video, because CD-ROMs dominated the world of um, e-learning content come about 1990. And this is when the term multimedia was coined, and multimedia became the name for the profession, uh, just as e-learning or learning technology is now. And CD-ROM had one very big disadvantage in that it was, uh, when it was first introduced, it didn't have enough bandwidth to support video. So we were brought back to graphics, still graphics, and animation as being the primary media driver, if you like, visual driver. And the graphic designer became king. In fact, graphic designer um, took over the, um, the, 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 dominated the experience from that point on, and interfaces and everything else became much more important than learning design. Programmers, you tried to avoid using them because that slowed down the whole process and made it very expensive. And so we, were, we, we developed a model which is not that dissimilar from what we see now, which is graphics and text 
orientated content. Um, some good things came out of that, some lovely graphic design. But unfortunately, the instructional designer was way down the pecking list uh, at, at this point in time. And so learning became much less, the learning design became less ambitious. Anyway, long, I, I, I sort of left the area of content development as a prof profession um, probably about 10 years ago, which I'd been involved in, a, in running a very large, um, you know, in the, terms of, in the terms of these can be, very large production studio um, where, you know, we, uh, all of these things happened. But, um, you know, the, the, the phenomenon that, that, that made me get out of this was the fact that, uh, that I particularly hated was the fact that everything was late and everything was over budget and therefore customers were always screaming at you. Um, everybody was always incredibly unhappy and uh, I didn't want to spend my days managing those projects. Now, the era of, pro of the project manager has solved that because I, when I talk to people now who do uh, content development, they say, uh, you know, they hardly ever talk about the fact of a project being over budget or late. We've become a very extremely efficient at producing content. I, I don't know whether your experience is like this. It seems like an impossible dream, but apparently this is true. Anyway, we're very good at it now. It's a very efficient um, uh, business. But on the other hand, in a way, the e-learning community, if you can call it that, can be accused of being rather blinkered. And they're being rather blinkered because, as we've heard from Gillian, they've probably heard from every presentation this year and for the last five, so much is changing that we need to be uh, rethinking what that content is. We've gone through all these stages of development, but is that what we're producing actually any use? Do we want to carry on doing that? Some of the things that have changed in that period, obviously connectivity, the very biggest difference that, um, that I've experienced in learning technology is when the internet and particularly the World Wide Web came in in the mid-90s because now it, what, we, what we were looking at as a medium was not just a content delivery medium but a communication and collaboration medium and in many respects it, that's the, that should be um, the dominant uh, use of uh, the, the internet in learning sense, communication and collaboration. However, in the world of corporate uh, e-learning, content is still absolutely king. But that connectivity has been rather ignored. So all we have now is the same old content that would have been on CD-ROM or on interactive video disc presented online. We've got obviously much greater IT literacy. So the people that we are working in learning development are not all completely naive now in terms of technology. I mean, you could equate that to teachers, uh, uh, perhaps. Um, you c uh, and certainly the people that we're training are not, uh, are not illiterate anymore. There's, there's a much wider IT literacy. We have much more easy to use tools and we have very different expectations as we we're talking about in terms of people wanting to feel that content is something that they can be involved in and this is going to be something I'm exploring in a minute. So as far as I'm concerned, the blinkers are on very much. And, uh, and that's the best I could get on blinkers, by the way. On <laughs> but uh, apparently that's what blinkers are. Um, and, uh, but what we're really entering, I think, in terms of content development is the uh, era of the user. And that means uh, that essentially content development is a, a, a user-generated phenomenon as well as a specialist top-down phenomenon. And, that, and that's what I'd like to explain to you how that might happen. And just, uh, I don't normally like these sort of big uh, corporate uh, executive quotes, but this one is so scary. And this chap, I actually think if I was to meet him, I wouldn't like him at all, and he would be very scary. Um, but uh, I think he, he, used, he ran General Electric in the US. Well, Jack Welch actually hit, put the, hit the nail on the head with this particular quote, that when the, change, then the rate of change outside exceeds the rate of change inside, then essentially the end is in sight. And so many of us, um, uh, are probably experiencing that phenomenon at the moment where we feel that somehow or other we're just not keeping up with what's the change that's occurring in society. And we might be, if we're not, if we're not careful, we become marginalized and, and, and on the periphery of the world of learning. In, in many respects, in the corporate setting, we've been, we've been, that point's been hammered home anyway over the last few years that at least 80% of everything that anyone learns at work is infor learnt informally. It's never learnt, not learnt through any formal intervention. I would say it's much higher than 80%. It could be 95%. So that's already making us feel peripheral. And if we're not ca ca uh, careful, we become even more peripheral. So this is a model which, um, in the true tradition of training, I'm sure it applies in education, has been stolen, lock, stock, and barrel. This isn't mine. 
from um, a, a good friend of mine called Nick Shackleton Jones, who works at the BBC, who actually has a great job title of a head of informal learning, which I think is, must, be, uh, must be unique in, uh, in, in a corporate setting. And he, he, he presented um, this, this pyramid and, uh, idea, and I'd like to pass this on to you. And what he was saying that the top end of this pyramid is what is the sort of content that I've been describing over the last few decades. It's what I call high-end content. In fact, what often I call Hollywood content. In other words, it's designed for big audiences, and it's designed with big budgets and lots of specialists working on it. And the, there's a very uh, good argument for having high-end content if you have large audiences and you have or you have critical skills and, and knowledge to uh, impart. Um, but it, it's, it's not flexible enough uh, to cover the whole need. So we're now hearing very much in the corporate sector about the concept of rapid e-learning. And rapid e-learning is essentially much more quick and dirty content, still produced from the top down primarily, but it's coming from subject experts and generalist teachers and trainers, if you like, rather than from um, specialist designers of content. And of course, at the same time, we're seeing the phenomenon, not so much, um, I think, in the world of work yet, but certainly outside the world of work, where content is not just something that is done to you, but it's something you participate in the creation of. Uh, whether that's in a formal learning context where content is seen as the output of the learning experience rather than the input to the learning experience, or whether it's part of your informal learning that you do at work, where you contribute to the, uh, if you like, the reservoir of information and knowledge which is uh, open to people in your organization. And with all the changes that we're seeing, the higher IT literacy, the better connectivity, easier tools, that's becoming a very realistic process. So we've got some content which is, cut, cut, is centralized, it's top down, it's coming from some managerial decision, uh, it's, it's given some formal budget, um, which is probably to meet the you know, the, using the sort of Pareto principle, the 20% of needs which apply, uh, or 80% of occasions, and all those needs which are highly critical. So obviously, if you work in a very, uh, uh, in a type of job where there's a very, there are very dangerous aspects to what you do, like flying a plane or whatever, there may only be a few of you as pilots in that organization, but the skills that you have to learn are so critical that uh, it still has to be approached on a top-down basis. And we're very glad when we fly to find out that our, Pilots have spent hours in a simulator that cost millions and millions of dollars. Um, even though we might say, well, that's a lot of money to spend on one person's training. We're very glad that they do that. Uh, on the other hand, uh, organizations change so rapidly, and what people need to know changes so rapidly, that uh, if we didn't have some bottom-up mechanism, and they always have existed, after all, we've always helped each other to learn at work by... Uh, you know, we, we talk to each other, we ask our friends, we, we might write little job aids and create them for each other, but we can formalize that process by more of the bottom-up uh, uh, cre uh, creation of content. Now, you've probably heard of the context of the long tail, and I think the long tail applies equally well in a corporate setting as, uh, in, in content as it does in the broad sense. Now, if you, ha if you haven't heard of the context of the long tail, it's really the idea that uh, if you were to take the example of, say, an Amazon um, uh, as a bookshop, that the, um, or let's take the example of an ordinary bookshop, to take, uh, first of all, um, like a Borders or a Waterstones or whatever, that they, they, because they've got very limited book space, they can only afford to uh, keep the, uh, a certain number of books available there and then that you can take off the shelf. So they have to look at the large audiences who are, gonna, who are most likely to come in and need content. Uh, whereas if you looked at something like uh, Amazon's book sales, the majority of the sales that they make are books are, of books that would never appear in Waterstones or in Borders because the minority, as, as the long tail spreads out here over to the right, where the, not, the quantity of people who have a particular requirement it, um, reduces and reduces till it's just a few people are interested in a particular topic. Uh, the, the long tail, if you look at the area of the long tail, it's greater than the number of, uh, the, the number of people who are in the, if you like, the, in, in the mass media majority. And Amazon is act actually sells more books of that category than they would do of the former category. So if we put this in the context of um, e-content, then you could say that where we have a need, we have a large number of people who need a particular piece of content. 
then this is a job for specialists. And I, I, I think that there's always been some resistance in training, and that might be true in education as well, some resistance to the idea of centralizing anything. In other words, that you actually create some great pieces of content. You do it once. You don't keep reinventing it. And then you know, it's done forever after, like the greatest and best piece of math teaching software or the greatest and best bit of teaching of how to do marketing or whatever it might be. That sometimes it is actually a good idea to centralize effort and get the job done really well. And that's the sort of Hollywood model, if you like. Uh, ho hopefully better, uh, more sophisticated content than Hollywood would produce. Uh, then I think as you go down through the long tail, you've got jobs that I would say are for the subject experts and the generalist teachers and trainers who can contribute content but still on a top-down basis because it's coming from purveyors or facilitators of learning rather than learners themselves. Um, but they, they, they can meet that middle uh, sector, whereas enthusiast users uh, or ordinary employees in organizations can also make a big contribution. It's not going to be everybody that does this. It is going to be the enthusiasts. Let's just think about a minute what we're talking about with content, because content is, 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 a, is a rather, you know, like many things, it's a, a word which, which is hard to define. Let's just remember, first of all, we're talking about all sorts of media, text and graphics, audio and video. I think also learn, it, it, content has different purposes. It's not just learning. It can also be essentially selling an idea. It can also be providing information. Now, in, in a pure educational context, you, these, dif, these distinctions are quite important. But in an organizational context, they're much less important. Providing information that helps someone to do their job uh, without them actually learning that information is still a very valuable thing to do. Providing information that at the same time might sell an idea is also a very valuable thing to do. If you don't combine and coordinate these things, you have to treat them, you, you have to often duplicate the, the, the content development activity. But content can have multiple purposes. And I think of one of the most difficult things I find to get across to learning designers is the fact that the interactivity which, um, if you like, is necessary to turn content into learning can happen in very many different ways too. And I think this, I, I think this is perhaps one of the most interesting aspects of this, that you can make the content itself interactive, as we all, as we all know. And that, if you like, forces the pace. It, it creates a form of structured instruction or some sort of guided discovery activity. But essentially, somebody has preordained what that interactivity should be. But I think we can, it's also perfectly okay to say that content can be linear and non-interactive. In other words, it's, it's a passive experience in terms of the medium itself. But you, the learner, can create your own activity, interactivity. You can make it into a learning experience because you do things like write notes. You reflect on things. You discuss them with your colleagues. You create the interactivity that makes reading a book or listening to a presentation or listening to a podcast or a radio program into a learning experience. You do the work. And more independent learners are capable of doing that. Sometimes I, I, I'm re, one of the biggest criticisms there is of most e-learning content is that it's patronizing and dull. And often that's because the interactivity is being built in uh, in a way for people who don't actually need that, uh, all that prompting and saying now is the time to reflect, now is the time to, uh, you know, to test what you know on this particular topic. And in fact, they're perfectly capable of doing that for that for themselves. Present the content in a really engaging and interesting way might be enough. But the other thing, and this is, this is very dominant um, way of thinking now, I think, in corporate e-learning, is that the interactivity can be in another learning uh, form. Formal, le formal learning um, form, like it could be that you, you view a piece of content and then you discuss it in a classroom, or you, view, or you, you read a piece of content and you discuss it on a forum or in a, or in a virtual classroom or some other place. The, the content doesn't have to be a self-contained activity. It can just be a trigger or a catalyst for some other formal learning activity. So again, you, you hear about... Um, the concept of this content is just a page turner. I don't know if you've heard that expression. It's very, it's very common criticism of content. It's just a page turner because it's, it's not interactive in any way. And yet we never, uh, we never describe uh, a novel in a negative way by saying it's a page turner. We say 
this is a real page turner. It's a real compliment. This is something that we can't wait to turn the next page. It's not the fact that it's a page turner that's the problem. It's the fact that what is on the pages isn't very interesting. So interactivity for its own sake built into the content isn't always important. And if you take the interactivity out of the content, it actually becomes a lot easier for teachers and trainers and people who are not you know, formally trained designers to create content which make a very big contribution. Because one of the most difficult things they have to, if, if they have to do it, the, the, you know, the, the old-fashioned way, if you like, with a lot of integrated interactivity, they have to learn how to program that or create those, that interactivity using tools and so on. So here's just some examples of the sorts of things that you might see as top-down content and some of the sorts of things you might see bottom-up. And, um, you know... I'm not saying then that we're just talking about the traditional e-learning tutorials and games and simulations and things on the top-down side. Some of those are just fairly passive uh, media, like white papers and podcasts and interviews and so on. But, and, and so content can take very many forms. And on the bottom up, we've got all of the new user-generated content forms that, we're, that um, uh, we've heard about and, and probably participate in ourselves. And, and uh, like um, Jilly, um, I'm a big believer in uh, blogging. Um, I suppose I have to be as somebody who spends far too much time doing it. I'm a big believer in the power of blogging as a learning experience. Uh, although <coughs> I must admit that I'm also very skeptical about how many people who actually uh, you know, would want to do it on a, on a long-term basis. But there are lots of, there certainly are enthusiasts, and I used that term earlier, enthusiasts in organizations, who are the sort of people who would like writing blog postings, putting postings onto forums, creating content in wikis, and so on. So let's just um, let's sort of remind ourselves, why, is it why, why do we need rapid content in organizations? Well, I'm just going to do this really quickly. This is how rapid e-learning is defined at the moment. It, uh, uh, it, essentially, it's done quickly, and it's done by subject experts, or you could call them teachers and trainers, rather than by experts. That's what we're talking about when we talk about rapid e-learning. Why are we doing it? because apparently an awful lot of tra training challenges now are time critical. And, you know, this is just a US figure, but I think it's true over here as well. A great uh, majority of trainers are under, uh, under pressure to produce um, their e-learning much more rapidly. We need a way of producing content that isn't Hollywood. We need a much cheaper model. And those people that sell, um, this is an argument I presented a, a few times to some of these um, tool manufacturers themselves, some of the most popular tools uh, makers in the world of rapid e-learning. In other words, that w these are people who produce tools that allow you to create interactive e-learning very quickly, are, I think, at the moment, swimming in a very, they're big fish in a very small pond. This is how I describe them. Um, in other words, they're selling to this same community of educational technologists and uh, e-learning people, whereas in fact the number of people who could be producing content, really good content, is actually all of those people who have access to technology anywhere in the world and uh, who are in somewhere in involved in the world of work. So they could actually be a small fish in a very big pond selling hundreds of millions of copies of their, um, of their tools and software because there are hundreds of millions of people who would like to be able to share what they, you know, what, what they, their presentations and their thoughts and their, um, it, it, you know, their rules and guidelines and principles with other people. I don't know why they don't find that a very uh, exciting possibility, but in fact, in fact it's, the reality is that they're very much the big fish in the small pool. So that's not, we're not just talking about rapid content from the top down, we're also talking about bottom-up content. And I'm going to explain why I think bottom-up um, educational content is a good idea. And I'm going to do this with, uh, with a ser series of pictures which w uh, my wife took um, and didn't have any idea what I was going to do with them. And she was very extremely confused about this activity. But um, let, let, me do, let, let me take you through a number of different scenarios. Now, I am not a professional photographer. Okay? You, that's not in itself very interesting. But, you know, uh, even though I'm not a professional photographer, I can produce... Uh, you know, really fairly decent quality photographs, and I can edit them in very low cost, but extremely high powered software. And I can distribute my photographs on the World Wide Web to, uh, you know, is it one and a half billion people now? I'm not a professional movie director. If I was, would I be here? I'd be on the beach in, uh, you know, in, um, in Cannes. 
But even though I'm not, I can edit and I, I can use low-cost tools, low-cost software to, to, to produce really quite half-decent um, movie material. Um, and it's worth remembering that when I first went into corporate video in 1983, and we used to charge £1,000 a minute then for video. £1,000 a minute in 1983. We would probably be you know, charging a small fraction of that uh, 25 years on. And I can distribute my videos and do on YouTube to, an, to one and a half billion people. Similarly, I'm not a professional author, but I can use really good software to lay out a book. I can even make that book available to the whole world or printed on demand. So if you want my book, I can, you can say, I want a copy. They print it to demand and send it to you. It doesn't matter whether it's any good because there's nobody, no publisher that gets in the way to, to, uh, to um, act as a mediator in that process. And I'm not a professional graphic designer, but you know I can put together a few graphics. And even if I want to, I could even share those graphics with a billion and a half people. And I'm not, unfortunately, I did try, did try back in the late 60s, but um, professional musician, I'm not a professional musician, but I could do practically anything I wanted on, on the software, uh, you know, in, in, my, uh, in my own office. And I could share that easily on the MySpace and things like that. Now, the upshot of all this is I am a professional content developer, or at least I have been over the years. But if I wasn't a professional content developer, like these people, I wouldn't have the faintest clue that there were fantastic tools around that enable them to, you know, to, to create really good content, even sometimes just based on PowerPoint presentations, but at, you know, with lots of extra things added in, voiceovers and, and interactivity and so on. Um, that I could produce those with tools which are just as easy as the tools that I've, uh, I've just been talking about. And I can, you know, it's even possible to buy enterprise-wide systems which allows every person in your organization to have access to these tools. But if I was one of those people who wasn't a professional e-learning developer, I would be the last to know about it. Because somehow or other, when people buy these enterprise-wide tools, they forget to tell anybody other than the professional developers. I think there's, there's a reason for this. So how many more times do we have to be told that things are changing? That is, there's now a very blurred distinction between who's a teacher and who's a learner, who's an author and who's a reader. We're all participants in this. It's a much more democratic process. This, this is a really, really hard concept to, to bring into a, a hierarchical, top-down world of work. But it is an important concept. And, and it's a very liberating concept because usually we're trying to do the teaching and training with far too few people to do the job, far too many things to learn. We have to enlist everybody as a teacher, everybody as an author, and that way we can actually get the job done. However, you know, it's just a, a little bit of pragmatism here. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of this 99-1 rule, but it does apply quite well. Now, given the choice, to write blog entries, write, en write articles for Wikipedia, create new forum postings, I don't know, all of those sorts of things. One person in a hundred seems to do it. And that seems to be a reasonably permanent rule in the sense that it seems to apply across all of those different media. Nine out of a hundred are enthusiastic enough, confident enough to comment on the blog postings, make a little uh, change to an entry in the Wikipedia or some other uh, or wiki, or um, generally um, act as a contributor in modifying and, uh, um, and creating debate about content. The other 90% are passive consumers of that content, who are very happy to be pa passive consumers of it. When I say passive, they may well be thinking about it very hard and have views and opinions, but they don't actually get involved in the process. So we have to, we have to be aware that we're not suddenly going to find if there are a thousand people in an organization, we're going to have a thousand people creating content. We're not. We're going to get the one percent who are actually going to create content. But that is still an awful lot more than we have at the moment. Now, I, I'm very optimistic because I, I've um, been involved <coughs> quite a bit in doing the, um, collaborative distance learning courses over the last five or six years, and I do believe that you can actually, you know, people can actually um, be molded through 
uh, encouragement and opportunity to become uh, one of the synthesizers or the creators. In other words, you can actually build, if people, I don't know whether Jill has found this on her courses, that if people make regular forum postings uh, or blog postings and everything else as part of a collaborative distance learning course, will they then leave the environment of that course and do that uh, when, when there's no longer, a, uh, if you like, a, a constraint on them to do it or a, or a pressure on them to do that? I'd like to think um, that people will gradually become more confident contributors, so the 99-1 rule will somehow will, will get much better percentages there. And of course, the, the, the people coming through now you might ask yourself about your, your um, you know, the next generation on from yourselves and, uh, you know, w would they conform to those rules or would they actually be very well, you know, very, very enthusiastic contributors? So who has the skills? Well, I, I did this uh, aspect of this presentation at a, a number of events earlier this year. And I actually got people to say, well, what skills do you have in all sorts of media creation activities? And um, I asked them to rate themselves. I haven't got time to do it now, but you could do it in your head and say, well, <clears throat> you know, are you a professional enthusiast, an improver, a beginner, or a virgin? They were my, they were my um, terms, five stars down to one, in doing all of these things that you can see listed on the screen there. And what I was hoping to prove uh, from my experiment, because like all good experiments, I, I knew what I wanted to prove from it, <laughs> wasn't actually what came out of it, was that, um, th that people would rate themselves very lowly uh, on, on these particular scales, but that their children or children that they knew would be rated extremely highly on it. In other words, to conf c conform to the sort of uh, the expectation that people coming through in Gen Y and, the, and millennials and what have you are actually much more confident media creators. In fact, we found that there was, mm, there was already masses of media creation capability skill in an audience of people who were from boomers through down through the generation. It was very surprising. And that, a lot of that is because we've got consumers, that, we've got computers at home, and we do things on them which are much more interesting and adventurous than we do at the world of work. And we are beginning to develop these skills. And now we, we, we might be wondering, why do we have to spend 15 to 20,000 pounds to have an hour of e-learning created when I could actually do this myself? And uh, it's a good question. It's a very uncomfortable question if you sell that for a living. So uh, one of the projects that um, I had a lot of fun doing last year uh, in uh, 2007 was a project called the 60 Minute Masters. And this came out of a, uh, it was a sort of international project we, we, we had, we, we undertook using a, a wiki where we asked, involved a lot of different learning designers from around the world and say, well, look, if we want actually to have more people capable of creating good content, rapid content, if we but they only had an hour to learn all the skills needed to do it, what would we teach them? What were the key messages that we'd include? And we'd call this the 60 Minute Masters in Instructional Design. This was, uh, the, by the way, there was some really negative reaction from instructional designers to the, even the, the daring to suggest that it was possible to teach such skills in as little as one hour. But that was rather an enjoyable form of uh, interaction. I, I didn't have a problem with that. But we did get a, a number of people contributed to it, something like 10 or 15 people who were the 9% you know, the, the, um, the, the rather than the 1% who contributed to this process. And we did actually, on this wiki called the 60 Minute Masters, we did actually come up with a curriculum for <clears throat> a 60 minute course in instructional design. Now, on, if we have more time, I actually would ask that question again, I actually ask you to think for yourselves what you would put in there. And uh, I don't know whether we do have much time, do we? No, we don't. So we haven't, but uh, you know, you might like to think in your head what sort of things that you would bring up. But just to give you an idea, these were some of the things that, the, that people came up with. Um, I'm sure you get, a, if you, no need to write this down, I'm sure you get a copy of this presentation. But it's interesting to see that what people came up with was not particularly earth shattering or revolutionary, uh, but they were all things that sort of fairly sensible pieces of advice about things that could actually be covered in, uh, in an hour's course. Uh, and, you know, we did actually go on, go on from that to um, create several examples of that as a piece of training. Um, it, it's a 60-minute course. It, by the way, it was originally called the 30-minute masters. Um, I don't know if anybody knows the story of 30-minute masters, which is just to show that, um, you know, the worst thing you can do is when experts are asked to 
uh, come up with to uh, summarize what it is that they know. They always teach too much. They always put too much content in. So we broke our own rule and had 60 minutes worth rather than 30 minutes worth. It's a bit of an embarrassing, but in, in a way quite illuminating. But quite, quite a few hundred, I've probably several thousand people now have taken that course, and it's a bit of fun if you'd like to have a look at it. But it's, comp it's a completely free and very much a, a, a fun project. But it, it, it's, uh, interesting. it's an interesting endeavor in its own right. Now, what I'm usually faced with is learning, uh, learning technology professionals, people who design it for a living, saying, that's all very well, uh, Clive, you know, it's democratizing the whole process of content and allowing everybody in on our game. But as professionals, where does that leave us? Well, what I say is, well, look, go back to that high-end stuff and ask yourself, are you doing things like this? I'm just going to page through these. I won't insult you by reading them out. It's gone very quiet. And then you ask them the question, well, as a professional e-learning developer, how much of your work really is like that? And that's the embarrassing question. Because most of the time, it's not their fault, most of the time, people who've gone into this with a huge amount of skill and training and education of, the, of their own are being asked to produce what is essentially the same boring, boring for them, hopefully not for the learner, rapid content that, is, that, that sh really should be produced further down that. Um, the, the pyramid, when uh, their professional skills would be much better devoted and be much more challenging, much more interesting for them if they were actually doing things which were actually pushing things forward. Things that actually, as I was saying earlier, were quite common in the 1980s, which have practically disappeared uh, in, the two, in, the year, in, the, in the current decade very, very disappointingly. Well, not completely disappeared because obviously we're doing some of these things. But an awful lot of uh, e-learning content is still of essentially what I would say, it's ra rapid content, but sold at uh, Hollywood prices. I don't think I've got time for the reality check, but just to say that you know it's all very well asking people to, um, to change and start contributing to you know, bottom-up content and actually you know, start uh, making things that are for the benefit of other employees. But they need the means, they need the, the motive, and they need the opportunity. And that is essentially like the, the same things that a, a good criminal needs or the same thing that uh, an e-learning developer needs. So you can't just expect this to happen. People aren't just suddenly going to start producing content in organizations, rapid content or bottom-up content, because they, they have to be given um, some, some, some skills, they have to be given the time, the authority, there has to be some reward in it for them. And... Uh, that doesn't just happen uh, just like that. So it, it, if you don't actually create the right culture support, it won't happen at all. So going back to, uh, did anybody get that right, by the way? In binary terms, you see? Well, those of you who learned binary in school back many years ago, that, uh, that in fact, uh, an, an awful lot you know, has changed in terms of the opportunities. Unfortunately, not as much has changed in terms of what we've actually done with those opportunities as we'd like. And so like Jilly, I'm, I, I, as an eternal optimist, um, w w which I'm, I'm absolutely determined to, to maintain that perspective in spite of all, all, the, all the obstacles, as an eternal optimist, I believe that we will start to see a rapid um, taking up of the opportunities we've got available to us, and we will actually see... Um, not, it's not the end of Hollywood content or, or top-quality content, but the Hollywood content will be really, really uh, top-quality. It will deliver the mass market needs for good educational content. But we'll begin to see the, uh, far more people, all teachers and trainers, and ultimately all employees and all students, if you're looking in the educational context, will all be contributors to the process of, sh of, of developing knowledge which they can share uh, with each other. And that, I think, is... Uh, the opportunity that lies ahead over, over the next five or ten years. So thank you very much, everybody. Yeah, sure. Right, we've um, got a time for a, a couple of questions.
<laughs> Back there. I'm wondering if the um, uh, the high-end content um, and the advanced content is the sort of thing that's going to be taken over by the publishers of the world and the universities will be left with the low-end user-generated content and perhaps you might want to comment on I think on that would be a great change. Uh, I, I have worked a little bit with educational publishers and I've worked with publishers who produce material that's sold, if you like, as off-the-shelf product within the corporate area as well. And on the whole, I've found them extremely disappointing. And I, in many respects, because they don't understand the educational process well enough to be able to produce content that's actually engaging and people might actually learn from. And after all, they still they, they don't have that in-house. They've got to go out and get that, um, that expertise. Unfortunately, they don't necessarily do a very good job of it. Um, so I'm a little... Uh, I think it would be a great shame if that was to happen because um, you, don't ne you don't need a lot of money to produce um, top-end content. But you do need, if you don't have money, you need time and expertise and, and the will to make it happen. But uh, one of the dangers I feel that one of the worries I would have in the educational sector, and I'm an, I'm an outsider here, would be that if you don't collaborate on those activities, then you're always trying, you know, you're, you're, it's always going to be a much smaller endeavor than if you were working on a countrywide basis or an international basis to produce really wonderful content that could be shared across millions of people perhaps rather than just a, f a few thousand. So um, it's difficult because I understand the, the, the decentralization of teaching and training is a very, is a, is a very long established concept. But some things are better coordinated. They don't have to be coordinated by corporations and, and publishing companies, they can be coordinated otherwise. But I, I, I think it, it, if you're going to get over the problem that the publishers have all the money and you don't, you've got to get together and, and combine your forces, I think. Get the very best experts together. Okay. Um, well, we'll bring this session to a close then. Um, on behalf of Alt, we have a couple of uh, gifts to give to our speakers. Can I ask you all to um, thank both our speakers this afternoon for a very interesting uh, session. And thank you all very much.